All right. Thank you, Father. Thank you for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Man. I just want everybody to know that I'm excited. And I don't know. (laughs) I know that sounds foolish. But there was a time when I first started uh, talking. I was always excited. I was just so excited to share what the Lord was sharing with me. And um, I went through a season, thank you, good Lord, that everything only happens for seasons, where uh, I I was kind of putting my foot in my mouth, and I wasn't sharing. I mean, he was sharing things with me, but I hadn't developed a way to articulate it that maybe people could handle it. And uh, for for quite a while, I was disheartened and um, was having a real difficult time sharing, and I hadn't been in a place of excitement um, in a long time. But a, a couple of weeks ago, we, we had a pretty awesome meeting, um, and I really believe it was a turning point in, in my life uh, where I wasn't trying to constantly convince people what I was hearing from the Lord, but I was able to just speak what he shared with me. And whether that resonated with somebody else or not didn't matter, but it was what he was speaking to me. And I, I came from a place where I had to argue everything to just speaking things as a matter of fact. And it just, from that point forward, I have just been excited, just excited that I feel like I got my, my mojo back, <laughs> for, for lack of better term, or like, you know, and I'm just so excited with, for what the Lord is doing, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the body, in the local body, in, in the ecclesia, you know, not just nationwide, but even worldwide. Um, things, you know, they, they look bleak. Um, but that's okay because I trust in, in the Lord. I trust in Yeshua. I trust in Jesus. I trust in God. And, uh, you know, when, when I commit what I'm doing to him, that's a, the Lord has had that scripture that you said, Miss Brittany, you, uh, you know, lean not on our own understanding, but commit our, our works to the Lord and, and he straightens our paths. I know I'm butchering it. Uh, but he's just been telling me that lately. You know what I mean? Just trust him, trust him, trust him. And, and, and uh, he's going to make it all work out. And so we all need to have a hope, a hope that, that uh, Elohim, you know, Jehovah, God still sits on the throne and Christ is still sitting at his right hand interceding on our behalf. And, uh, you know, if those things look wild, we don't have really much to worry about. <laughs> um, or you could, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm done, I'm done worrying. So uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is discipleship through experiential relationship. Um, I really feel like the Lord wanted me to use, uh, I briefly covered uh, some information at Bibles and Brunch. Um, Rod and Nathan and myself, uh, for you guys that weren't here, put together a, like a three-person panel and all three of us sat together and, and Rod opened up with, with him being the lead of, of everything. Uh, he opened up with unity, um, you know, team ministry, uh, for all to be together on the same page. And, and then Nathan followed up with that with, with evangelism and, uh, you know, reaching out to a lost and dying world, reaching out to our community, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers. And then, and then I finished up with uh, discipleship through experiential relationship. And I think collectively um, on a worldwide scale with, with the church as a whole, uh, everybody seems to be sensing a, a mighty move of God coming. And, and we, there's a lot of people that are sensing just this influx, this, this, this charging of the atmosphere. And, and we just know that something's on the forefront. Now, none of us know exactly what that is or exactly what that looks like. But I think collectively as a whole, everybody is uh, with great expectancy that the Lord is about to move. And uh, with that being said... Uh, you know, I, I really think, uh, we collectively really think that, that we need to be in unity, that we need to be prepared to evangelize. We need to know and understand how to lead somebody to the Lord. And then uh, from that point forward, also, we need to understand and be able to move forward in a place of discipleship. And uh, so, uh, with all of that being said, uh, I'm going to go off some of my notes just from a couple of weeks ago. So if you guys were at the Bible with some brunch, bear with me. But then there's been uh, some significant stuff added to that. And uh, discipleship through experiential relationship. What I had started out with was uh, Matthew 28, 
uh, 18 through 20, and it is actually the Great Commission. And this is Jesus himself speaking. Um, You know, the letters are in red there. In that portion of the Bible, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And uh, I just wanted again to let you guys know that whether you think you may or may not be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, um, that doesn't matter, neither here nor there, because uh, the Great Commission was given to all of us. Um, And we weren't called to make converts into Christianity or to any other religion. We were actually called to make disciples. Make disciples of Jesus. Um, You know, not make disciples of me, but continually and constantly be pointing people to a relationship with Christ. And so uh, some of the things that I wrote down um, was what are some of the things that the disciples did with Jesus. And when I talk about the disciples, I'm talking about the 12, uh, his closest peers uh, that he, he shared a lot more intimately than he did with the world at large. So some of the things that the disciples did with Jesus was they spent time with him. I think that's probably the most important thing that they did was they spent time with him. And uh, we are called to not only make disciples of nations, but in order a lot of times to, to make something, you have to be that something. We, you know, we have to be disciples before we can make disciples. And it isn't one necessarily or the other, but even as we're being disciples, we are to be discipling others. We are to share our life experiences and the things that we've been through with those around us. You know, in Revelations, it says we're set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's the word of our testimony that sets brothers and sisters free from bondage. First and foremost, it's the blood of Christ. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is that we all have been through some sort of ridiculousness in our lives that somebody else may or may not be struggling with. And when we just share our stories with other people, it gives them hope. It gives them hope. So I think the most important thing that they did was they spent time, the disciples spent time with Jesus. Something else they did is they watched him teach. They watched him teach. And, uh, you know, as I was going through this, it's really hard for me to gather my thoughts or to funnel them down um, because I love his word. I love, Lord, I love you. I love God. I love Jesus. Um, And I just, you know, I'm beginning to understand, uh, you know, that there's a handful of scriptures in the Bible that are very, very important. And, you know, when When Jesus quoted Deuteronomy, he said, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. You know, there is something to reading this word that just makes me happy, makes me excited, it makes me confident, it makes me believe. uh, Oh my gosh, I just can't get enough of it. So when I'm uh, given the opportunity to put put a message together, sometimes it's tricky uh, because... There's so many good ones. How do you focus on just a couple? <laughs> so uh, they watched him teach. And uh, even where, where we're going to end up going with this actually is uh, John 5, 19, is Jesus only did what he seen the Father do. And so it was important for them to watch him teach. And what were some of the things that Jesus taught his disciples? If you really want to get to the nitty gritties, you could roll through uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. And these are Jesus' himself. These are his teachings. And so not only did he teach the world the Sermon on the Mount, but he also taught his disciples, uh, you know, key insights. Uh, he taught them things privately uh, in order for them to get an idea on what they were actually supposed to do. What, the, how, what, 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 what are we supposed to teach? What exactly are we supposed to teach? You know what I mean? Well... I would highly encourage you to go back and take a look at Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And the things that Jesus taught are the things uh, that we should at least be familiar with. Because I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, you're going to come into contact with somebody who's struggling with some of these things that he's talking about in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Everything from feeding the needy to, to greed and money to, uh, to marriage. I mean, he, he is on it. And I'm, it's a pretty safe bet to say what, what Jesus was teaching, it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> Especially if he only said what he heard the Father saying. His words were not his own words. His words were the mouth of Elohim, God the Father. So, some other things that they did was they watched him pray. 
Um, some other things where they asked him questions. Again, that really has to do with spending time with him. The father loves it when you ask him questions. I never understood this. I had a crazy relationship with my father. But now my son asks me questions. And my son asks for advice. And when he does, I glow. I'm like, I'm nobody really. But he thinks I'm somebody. And it, it's an honor for me to share the wisdom and the life experiences that I have with my son. And we are all sons and daughters of the Most High. And he knows the beginning from the end, the front from the back. You know what I'm saying? He, he, he has it all. He has all of the answers to everything. So when we come to him and we ask him questions, when the disciples asked Jesus questions, it was a special thing. Um, sometimes the Lord doesn't always give me the answers that I'm looking for, or the answers that I want, maybe I should say. He does answer me, but it doesn't always line up with Scott's will. A lot of time it winds up in his will. And uh, so um, some other things they did was the disciples, they obeyed Jesus um, and they followed him. And, and uh, even in that song, Oceans, um, Azriel, you knocked it out of the park. That was awesome. That was so awesome. Uh, so, you know, in that song, Oceans, he says, lead us into the deep waters. And I can tell you, the Father, the, the, you know, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has led me into some sticky situations. And uh, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. You know, as soon as uh, Jesus, as soon as the Holy Spirit ascended upon Jesus like a dove right after John the Baptist baptized, uh, you know, Yeshua, immediately the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. I'm telling you, that doesn't sound fun to me. It doesn't sound fun. But he trusted his Father. And even though it didn't look and seem fun, he did it because he trusted him. And I'm telling you, it's not always peaches and cream walking with the Father, but if you trust him, it's all going to pan out. I just finished watching an episode of uh, The Chosen. I don't know what number it is, season two, something. But Jesus took his disciples to Samaria where the Jewish you know, uh, people weren't exactly received with open arms. Uh, in this particular episode, uh, even, I believe it was, was it Peter? One of the disciples got spit on by people from Samaria. Now, I just, I don't know. But my first inclination when I seen him get spit on, I thought, well, punch him in the face. That probably isn't what the Lord would do. Um, but I'm saying Jesus led his disciples into areas where they weren't exactly welcomed. It wasn't all fun and games, but they trusted him and it all worked out. So some other things that they did was they pressed into him, into his understanding. Um, you know, in Isaiah 55, 8, 9, we've, we've been on this for a year. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 is his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You know, and even in the, in the, in the other song, you know, for, for we give the Lord permission to tear down our traditions, to come against and break down our traditions and our forms of religion in order for him to encounter us and move the way he sees fit. Lord, we give you permission to break out of this box that we put you in, our minds, and teach us what you want us to be taught. <sighs> um, man, his understanding and his truths, they are so much more not me. <laughs> They're just not how I would think about things. And he, he's constantly stretching us. And so they pressed into him and his understanding and his truths, and they watched him love unconditionally. And this is something, again, that, that I myself am working on. It's how to love people unconditionally. Uh, I've learned uh, over time that one minor uh, you know, problem with humanity is that when we find people that don't think identically to us, we tend to want to cut them off and out of our lives like they are not important, like they don't exist, and like they're irrelevant. And that is not something that that Jesus did. Jesus loved people right where they was at. He, he, he didn't throw the stones of, you're a sinner and you're going to hell. <laughs> Is that a fact? It could be. It could be. They may be sinners and they may be on their way to um, Sheol. But that doesn't mean he pointed it out. He loved them unconditionally. For love covers a multitude of sins. We, we need to really come to that understanding. And... Uh, so those are some of the things that Jesus' disciples did. Now, what are some of the things that Jesus did with his disciples? So some of the things that Jesus did with his disciples was he taught them about the kingdom. 
He taught them about the kingdom. What exactly is the kingdom? I went to looking this up, and actually Paul states it. Um, I don't remember. I know it's in Romans, but I don't remember the chapter. Uh, it might be chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, where he said that uh, the, kingdom of, the kingdom of God is not about what you eat or drink, but it's peace, uh, joy, and what is it? Somebody help me. Love? Is that what it is? Peace, joy, and love? And so I, I know that he, Jesus taught them about those things, but I can't say that Jesus himself said that because I believe Paul actually quoted that one. But Jesus taught the disciples what the kingdom actually is. It's uh, righteousness, it's peace, it's love. Um, he taught them how to understand Scripture. You know, when Jesus came on scene, the New Testament had yet to be canonized. The New Testament had yet to be written. And so he took them back through uh, the Tanakh, or he took them back through the Old Testament, and he showed them where the prophecies were pointing to him. And he showed them where he was and, and how all of these things were pertaining to him. He taught them that he was the Old Testament, in fact, wrapped in flesh. That's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 14, was that he was the Word that became flesh. And he showed them how to take what, uh, what sin did and, and took the Word of God and changed it into a thing of bondage and legalism, and he showed them how to live that out. He, sh he took what was written down and showed them the essence of it or the spirit of it, you know? Not to actually commit adultery, but, but to not even look at woman with lust in your eyes or not even to look at a man with lust in your eyes. And, you know, not to, not to necessarily physically kill somebody, but not to even have malicious thoughts about them. I can't tell you how many people that I've murdered with my mouth. How many people have I talked about and said, that person ain't worth a rip, that person this, and that person that. And that essentially is murdering somebody's character. That's character assassination. And Jesus said that that stuff is not acceptable. That stuff is not acceptable. And uh, so he took what was written and he took it to a higher level. He taught them the meanings of Scripture. He taught them how to understand Scripture at a higher level. He taught them his purpose. His purpose is... Uh, his purpose, actually, he states his purpose again in Isaiah 61. Uh, <clears throat> he taught them what his purpose of his ministry was. What's the purpose of his ministry? And I bookmarked this real quick, so I'll just read to you real quick a little bit of Isaiah 61. This was the first, when Jesus went to the synagogue and he began to teach, this was the first thing that he shared. The very first thing that he shared. And he didn't say it like they said it. He said it with authority. He said it because this scripture was fulfilling prophecy pertaining to him and what the Messiah was going to do and how the Messiah was going to show up. The purpose of the Messiah was this. This is what Jesus said in Isaiah 61, verse 1. He says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to announce that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. That's what Jesus' purpose was. Do you understand that? <clears throat> and if Jesus is making disciples, which would be you and I, that would mean that that too is our purpose. That too is our purpose. Our purpose is that the Lord has appointed each and every one of you to bring the good news to those that are poor. He has sent each and every one of you to comfort the brokenhearted and to announce that the captives will be free. Every single one of you. Well, how would you set a captive free? Well, it would be called deliverance. It would be called setting them free from bondage. Some people would maybe call it cast out demons. Some people would maybe call it renewing of the mind. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to prove the acceptable, perfect will of the Lord. Freedom from bondage. This was Jesus' purpose. This was what His ministry was all about. And because we are disciples of Jesus, that too is our ministry. <clears throat> so He taught them to feed the hungry. This was uncomfortable, wasn't it? Wasn't it uncomfortable for the Messiah to say, feed 5,000 people with a couple loaves and a couple fishes? I would feel like, no. No, thank you. Thank you, drive through. Uh, somebody else can do that. But he made a way. He showed them their lack of faith. You know, last week when Nathan was taught, teaching, and every single time you said faith or believe in my head, immediately, as soon as you said it, the word trust 
Every time you said faith, the word trust came into my head. Every time you said believe, the word trust came into my head. So try to think about that. Believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Have faith in Jesus. Have trust in Jesus. Trust him. Trust him. Something that I'm working on, I've had a lot of broken relationships in my life, which causes me to not trust humans, maybe to the capacity that I should, but that's okay, because the Lord is working with me, and I'm trying to trust people more and more and more, and I, keep, I get bit too, still, and it's hard to trust when people bite, or you could say sheep, sheep bite. <laughs> so uh, he taught them to put their faith slash trust in him. <clears throat> Um, he taught them to fast. And I had to change this little part right here. He taught them to pray and he taught them to fast. I had to change it because my awesome brother Nathan brought some insight and revelation to myself. <clears throat> um, you know, when Jesus was talking about, or let me see here, there was a man whose son was possessed by an evil spirit and the evil spirit kept throwing his son down into convulsions and, and this and that. And, 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 and this man brought his son to the disciples to cast this demon out and they could not do it. And, and, and I'd always heard my whole, you know, it's even still in, in this. I didn't know that in some of the original manuscripts, it says this kind only comes out by prayer. I always heard it read and, and, and seen it read, this kind, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. And so I had to change my stuff here, Nathan, thank you. <laughs> Was, uh, you know, in Matthew 6, 5 through 15 is the Lord's Prayer. Um. And again, here we are with Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. Please take a look at them. He taught them how to pray through the Lord's Prayer. And uh, it's, it's pretty simple. He starts out with our Father. It is so important that we start that prayer out with our Father because when we say our Father, it, says, it shows that we are in union with Christ. We do not just bounce right into the throne room of sons of the Most High. I promise you that. <laughs> We only enter into that through the blood of Yeshua, through the blood of Jesus. And so we open up the prayer, Our Heavenly Father, recognizing, accessing God the Father, Elohim, the Most High, through Yeshua, through Jesus. You guys tracking with me? So he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name is honor your name. Our, one of our greatest things that we should be doing is bringing honor to the name of Yehovah. We should be bringing honor to God the Father. We should not live a self-satisfactory life, we should be living for Him and for His cause. Hallowed be Your name is to honor Him. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't exactly know what it looks like in heaven. I have little glimpses through His Word on what heaven looks like. And I'm supposed to live down here like it is up there. I don't have a full revelation of that. I'm still working it all out. But uh, I'm telling you, it doesn't look like what I thought it looked like. Um, so, live on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. There it is. There is. There's Jesus again battling Satan and even quoting Deuteronomy, saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. Uh, give us this day our daily bread. Um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, that is a, a if-then type thing, an if-then statement. If you forgive people their trespasses, you will be forgiven. Um, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, all of these in the Lord's prayers all say, we, us, <laughs> our, all of this whole prayer is praying to God the Father through Jesus. Um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever. Amen, I think. That's all just memory. <laughs> and then, so, he taught them to fast. And Matt, what's awesome, same chapter, Matthew 6, 16 through 18, he says, fasting should be done in private, not to impress men. Now, I'm not a big fan of fasting. <laughs> I'm getting better at it, but denial of self is not for the faint of heart. Whether it's food, pop, water, whatever, TV, cars, gas, friends, fishing, hunting, anything pleasurable unto yourself, to lay that down for an extended period of time isn't always the funnest but it has very big ramifications. Um, you know, there were times that fasting actually helps you at a majority of the time. You know, his word says that when we are weak, he is strong. And so when our flesh 
is in a weakened state, um, we tend to uh, hear spiritually a little more clearer. And even when I believe that they were getting ready to send Paul and Barnabas out, they were praying and they, they seeked the Lord and they did some fasting so that the Lord's voice would be magnified. Um, so, uh, he taught them deliverance. Um, he taught them how to heal the sick. He taught them that in Luke 10 where he sent out the 72 and then actually before that in Matthew 10, he sent out the 12. And so, we begin to see this pattern in the Bible or an example of disciples, disciple making, where it maybe starts out with a small number, but eventually it rolls into something a little bigger. And, uh, you know, again, the, the most important thing uh, was he taught them unconditional love. When they made a mistake, uh, he didn't kick them to the curb. Oh, do I have to work on that? <laughs> I have a lot of grace for those that I hardly know, but those that are closest to me, example, sons and daughter, uh, I have a real difficult time extending grace to them. Boy, I want to drop the hammer on them. And uh, I probably shouldn't, because that's not how the Father does me. So, uh, Jesus taught the disciples uh, spiritual disciplines. The word disciple actually comes from the word discipline. And they are spiritual disciplines. They're not always easy. They're not always fun. Discipline is exactly what it sounds like. Not fun. <laughs> Discipline, whether it's a spanking, whether it's running, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's getting up and reading my Bible early in the morning, you have to discipline yourself to make these things happen. And eventually, they become part of who you are. You know, I was getting up every day and spending an hour with the Lord from about five to six, and something happened, and I quit doing that. And, and then it turned into like five minutes with the Lord. <laughs> and then it turned into no time with the Lord. We'll just talk when I'm driving to work. And uh, it just got kind of sloppy. And so that's a discipline that fleeted me for a while. And he's calling me back to that. He's been, uh, we've been arguing actually. He's been telling me to get up and spend some time with him. And, uh, and I keep telling him, Lord, I'm tired. <laughs> Lord, I'm tired. And uh, sure enough, at 4.30 in the morning, after I was complaining to him about waking me up so early, he said, don't you think that I have the power to make you not tired? And I said, okay, I'll get up. Spiritual disciplines is what Jesus taught his disciples. So we are all called to make disciples. We are all called to be disciples. And again, we're not called to make disciples of Scott or whoever each one of you are under the sound of my voice. You put your name in that, you know. Susie isn't making disciples of Susie. She's making disciples of Jesus. <clears throat> That's super important. Um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, to follow him follow his example even as he follows Christ. So if he's not following the example of Christ, don't follow him. You know what? You, you know, pretty simple. <laughs> um, we have to point people to Christ constantly. We've got to constantly point people to Jesus. Um, discipleship is practicing dip, discipline. It's the spiritual disciplines through personal relationship with him first and each other's second. Personal relationship with him first, with each other second. I'm about to go through some things, and all of this discipleship is so important to him first, to people second. When we get that mixed up, it's a mess. I promise. I'm telling you from personal experience. When I try to have relationship outside of him, it doesn't work. Actually, it does work, but it makes for a mess like a mess mess. Because, for some reason, humanity has a tendency to want to be boneheads. And, anywho, enough about that. Dang, I'm a mess. 22, 34. 34 through 40, it says, but, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with this reply, they thought up a fresh question on their own to ask him. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbors as yourself. All of the other commandments and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love God first. Love our neighbors second. 
love our brothers second, okay? Now, that was what I shared uh, briefly at Bibles and Brunch. And when I began putting all this stuff together, I felt like the Father had asked me to keep that as the opening. And uh, so now we're going to turn over to John chapter 3, verse 22. John chapter 3, verse 22. Uh, This passage makes a statement that is easily overlooked. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've read this. Uh, Probably all have probably read it more than me. And we just read right over it like it ain't no thing. So uh, I'll read it to you. In the New Living Translation, it says, Afterward, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem, but they stayed in Judea for a while and baptized there. In the King James, it says, After these things came, Jesus and his disciples, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. If you need to know the, the precursor to that little piece, it's, that's right after uh, Jesus has an encounter with Nicodemus, who was a, uh, he was a Pharisee, and Jesus was reaching out to him, actually, and uh, he made his decision. He, he, he made his decision not exactly to walk with Christ because he enjoyed the comforts, the creature comforts, uh, the high esteem of being uh, a well-known uh, teacher of religious law. And actually, I think his heart wanted to, um, but... His better half didn't. (laughs) And I shouldn't, you know, I'm just going to leave that there. (laughs) Uh, Anywho, so after this encounter with Nicodemus, they they had left Jerusalem. And afterward, Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem, but they stayed in Judea for a while and baptized there. Um, That word right there, for a while, or um, in the King James, is he tarried. It is... uh, that's a Greek word, is diatribo. If you want to look it up, it's in the Greek uh, Strong's Concordance, 1304. And uh, I made a terrible mistake a few weeks ago by giving you guys tons of concordance numbers that was not out of the Strong's Concordance. <laughs> um, it was out of uh, Zadavaran, something, Zandervaran, or anywho. I gave out a whole bunch of numbers, and my awesome sister Brittany was like, hey, dude. Uh, this, uh, none of this is matching up. <laughs> and so I had to go back and figure out that Blue Letter Bible uses a Strong's Concordance, and I was in a different one. Um, so this, this word, this letter, is out of the Strong's if you want to check it out. And it means to rub against. It means to rub off. It literally means to spend time together rubbing off on each other. Think about that. He tarried with them for a while. They just stayed there for a while baptizing people and he rubbed off on them and they rubbed off on him. So what Jesus did, it was really quite simple. He selected a few people, the 12, and he hung out with them. He hung out with them. Um, He did ministry with them. Now, that's I wrote that very specifically. He did ministry with them. They didn't do ministry with him. He did ministry with them. And again, it, it, it kind of rolls back. I'm going to keep using this John 5, 19 over and over and over because it's a key to discipleship. It's a key to ministry. Jesus only did what he seen the Father do, and he only said what he heard the Father say. And so if I'm trying to do ministry and Jesus ain't moving in that area, I'm barking up the wrong tree. But if I can see with my spiritual eyes where Jehovah is moving and get in line with that, breakthrough happens. I can't minister on to people unto my own strength. I mean, I can try to, but it just doesn't really work out. So he did ministry, and they watched. He did ministry, and they helped. Our God is so gracious to allow us to partner with him as he changes hearts and he changes lives. It isn't about what I can do. It really isn't. And I hate to burst some bubbles in here, but it just ain't about you. Sorry. When Jesus tarried with them, something really special was happening. It reminds me of of people that are married for a long time, and they don't even have to... They can finish their spouse's sentences. You know what I mean? Some of them even start to look like each other. I'm sorry, Susie. (laughs) Uh, You know what I mean? It's uh, When you spend time with somebody, you, you begin to... 
metamorphosize into who they are. You know what I mean? And that's why it's so important to spend time with Him first and people second. Because when you spend time with people second, you begin to metamorphosize into them and them into you. But if you're not spending time with Him as the utmost priority, you're not conforming to the right image. They're not conforming to the right image, and neither are you. You have to be Him first. So if I'm going to work on discipleship, if I'm discipling my beautiful bride over there, I need to do about three quarters of my time with the Father and a quarter of my time with her. If I do three quarters of my time with her and a quarter of the time with the Father, we begin to duplicate one another instead of the Father. Are you seeing that? So when we can do that today, we can spend time with each other. Um, and when we do, we begin to rub off onto one another. We pick up similar interests. We begin to encourage each other. We start to talk like each other. We begin defending one another. I've hung out with people and I take up their mannerisms. I say the weird things as they say. All of us got some weird word, you know, behoove or I don't even know. I say weird stuff all the time. And when I say it, I'm like, why do I say that? <laughs> I think other people, anywho, people start to steal my verbiage and I start to steal their verbiage. Um, and, 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 and even, I wrote this down, I, I, you know, it's about spending time with Him first and people second. And the Lord showed me this when I was putting this together in my personal life, was I used to be ate up with hunting. I loved hunting. I mean, I loved it. I lived for it. And, and, and I didn't even understand um, really what was going on. And the Lord, I would go hunting, and I would think that I was going to kill this magnificent giant trophy. And, and I did a lot of times, but... Really what was going on was the Father was spending time. I was spending time with Him. He was showing me things in nature. He was showing me how, how mothers take care of their young and how the fathers protect and uh, in so many different things. Like uh, in, in geese, I would come around a corner and there'd be a family of geese, a mom, a dad, and all the kids. And the first thing that happens is the mom gathers the kids and runs and the dad gets between me and them. And it's like, that's how, that's how family's supposed to be. The father protects, the mother nurtures. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing started to speak into me so much through nature. And after so many years of spending time alone with the Father in nature, my heart has changed. I'm not into hunting as much as I used to be. Now I'm into fishing. Equally as expensive. Equally as time consuming. But in fishing, I can put somebody, I can, I can lock somebody on my boat for 10 hours a day and preach Jesus to them and they can't go nowhere. Oh, it's really a good gig for me. <laughs> now, they don't want to hear about Jesus. Sorry about their luck. So he took me from him, you know, spending all my time with him alone in the woods, sitting in a tree, wherever, to being with people. I went through this period of time of learning him, learning his words, his attributes, his characteristics, his mannerisms, the things he would do, the grace, the difference between grace and legalism, the difference between discipline out of love and discipline out of, it's just a consequence. You know what I mean? He's taught me so many things with me and him individually that he changed my heart now now i can go out and properly represent him in different areas i don't get it right all the time but i if i tried to represent him if i did the fishing with friends before knowing jesus it would just be about you know beer <laughs> and probably other ridiculousness <laughs> uh but i you know him first and then people second so uh What, what Jesus did was not just about hours and minutes. Some of him was rubbing off on them. What's crazy, what's crazy as you'll find out, is a lot of me begins to rub off onto him. He takes our hurts, the brokenhearted. You remember what he was sent here for, to preach the good news to the brokenhearted, to set the captive free? And when you spend time with him, my captivities rub off on him. My bondage rubs off on him. My brokenness rubs off on him. And his wholeness and his freedom begins to rub off on me. <clears throat> so one of the main ways that Jesus transformed his followers into people who would impact the world was simply by spending time with them. Pretty simple. Again, when he took me back to the beginning, or the beginning of this message, and I said some of the most, I think the most important thing that the disciples could do was spend time with Jesus. The Lord was showing me that as I was putting this, putting this again. Again, it reminds me of John 5, 19. He only did what he's seen the Father do. By spending time with him, I witness what the Father is doing. By spending time with him, I begin to only do what I see him do. 
I begin to recognize where he's at work and do that. You follow me? So uh, to truly have an impact on the world around us, all of us need to be loving, mentoring, and developing those around us. And please, use wisdom. I mean, I don't get around Rod and try to tell him how it goes. And he's, got a, he's got a day or two on me. So I listen to what he says. You know what I mean? When I get around Bill, I don't spend all my time trying to tell him what he should be doing. <laughs> I listen to their experiences. They got a few years on me. Is it always, do I always apply it? No. Do I sometimes? Absolutely. I mean, we got to use wisdom. You know, you, you, you guys that are 25 years old, don't go to your infant and ask them for advice. You know, it just isn't the way that it works. So use wisdom. Um, and, and those of us that are a little older, not, you know, and that are mentoring and that are, you know, developing, you know, don't get offended when they don't do exactly what you say. It's okay. Unfortunately, I'm the type of guy that has to step in the poo. Even though you told me it was there, hey, there's poop right there. Don't step in it. Okay. It's just the way it is. <laughs> anyway, just love unconditionally. Show a little grace. Um, uh, turn with me now to Mark uh, chapter 3. We're going to hang out in verses uh, 7 through 15. We're... We're really going to hang out in 13 through 15, but I need 7 to kind of put together a little bit of backstory. So, uh, Mark 7, or I'm sorry, Mark 3. What is my deal today? Mark 3. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 15. Well, I'm going to break this up into four sections, okay? Now, if you're taking notes, I'll say these in the sections that I wrote them down. Number one is he started with the few, not the many. And that'll be uh, 3, 13, and 14. Number two is he prioritized relationship, not curriculum. He prioritized relationship, not curriculum. And that'll be uh, 3, 14. And then number three was he focused on sending capacity, not seeding capacity. That's going to be 3, 14, and 15. And then number four is he handed off authority instead of holding on to it. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read this, uh, Mark chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 7 through 15. Jesus and his disciples went out to the lake, followed by a huge crowd from all over Galilee and Judea. Jerusalem, Idumea, I Idumea, from east of the Jordan River, and even from as far away as Tyre and Sidon. The news about his miracles had spread far and wide, and vast numbers of people came to see him for themselves. Jesus instructed his disciples to bring around a boat and have it ready in case he was crowded off of the beach. There had been many healings that day. As a result, many sick people were crowding around him, trying to touch him. And whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, they would fall down in front of him, shrieking, You are the Son of God. But Jesus strictly warned them not to say who he was. Afterward... Jesus went up on a mountain, and he called the ones he wanted to go with him, and they came to him. Then he selected 12 of them to be his regular companions, compelling them, or call, I'm sorry, calling them apostles. He sent them out to preach, and he gave them the authority to cast out demons, and these are the name of the 12 that he chose. I'll keep, I'll, just for the name's sake. It was uh, Simon, who uh, was also called Peter, James and uh, John, which were the sons of thunder, or the, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, then you had Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, uh, James, uh, that's James too, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, then you had Thaddeus, uh, Simon the Zealot. Zealots are awesome. I just finished the study on zealots, and they're awesome, but we're not, we'll save that for another time. Um, and then Judas uh, Iscariot, who betrayed him. So, um, <clears throat> he started with the few and not the many. So here we see the crowds uh, swell up to large numbers, and they all wanted a piece of Jesus, all of them. Uh, they wanted to hear him talk. They wanted to get close to him. But verse 13 and 14, it says, Jesus called to himself those he wanted. And Jesus was establishing apprenticeship based on relationship. Now, I want everybody in here, everybody under the sound of my voice, to know 
that you were called. You were chosen. You were wanted. You are loved. You were called to be a representative of God's kingdom. You were all called to be ambassadors. Ambassadors have authority. If, 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 if you go to another nation and you go to the embassy, there's an American ambassador there who carries the weight and the authority of our laws, our rules, and our regulations. You are an ambassador of God's kingdom. You carry His authority. You carry His rules. The water parts for you. When you walk into a ridiculous situation, the atmosphere changes. You have nothing to be afraid of. I've been in some shady situations. And the Lord always turns it around for my benefit. And He does the same thing for you. Okay? All right. Um, so, the number one, He started with the few and not the many. Um, Jesus was establishing apprenticeship based on relationship. It is equally important to note that he didn't focus only on the static noise of the crowd. Instead, he started with and focused on the twelve. There's a lot going on, and I have to always be cognizant of who I've been working with in the last one, two, three, four, five, six years. Um, I got a friend. I was at a meeting, and he was at a meeting. And it is very important for me to help him to understand that he is more important than all the other people at the meeting. Does that mean he is any more important than him? Not necessarily, but he is in my circle. You understand? I could have went to lunch with anybody I wanted and ended up at lunch with this person. You understand? All the static noise, all the people that want a piece of you, wherever that may be, because listen, somewhere you're important. It might not be in your household, because we're all just normal, but somewhere you're important. And somebody wants a piece of you for some reason. And sometimes you have to go, the static noise doesn't matter, my wife does. The static noise doesn't matter, my daughter does. The static noise doesn't matter, my brother or my sister does. You understand? So as much stuff was going on, healings and, and miracles and, and teachings and just awesome stuff going on, Jesus said, you, 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 come with me. And he wouldn't got mad if they said no thanks. But they didn't. But they didn't. So he focused on the few. That was number one. You can find that in verses 13 and 14. I'll just read them to you real quick. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and he called the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. <clears throat> so number two, we'll be working on verse just 14, is he prioritized relationship over curriculum. So should we. I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus prioritized relationship over curriculum, and so should we. Um, a phrase in verse 14 reveals the reason that he chose the twelve. It was so that they might be with him. Um, it kind of sounds really familiar to Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. Father, I pray that they are one as you and I are one. The reason he called them was because that they might be with him. Christ always wants us to be with him. God always wants us to be with him. That's the reason he called you, that you might be with him. That's the reason he called me, is that I might be with him. That's the reason Jesus prayed that prayer, is that we would understand that we're one, as him and God are one, that we are one with him. We are one with them. We are one with Jesus. We are one with God. You know how? Because he lives in you. He lives in us. <clears throat> it's pretty clear that Jesus was prioritizing relationship with the twelve. This was truly an apprenticeship that prioritized spending time together where the twelve could observe, learn, and do what he was doing. Again, 
John 5, 19, he only did what he seen the Father do. When we spend time with the Father, that's what we begin to do, only what he did. You know? Um, this apprenticeship that the disciples had with Jesus, it's the true intent and the expression of how Jesus did discipleship. He didn't just give them a, a sermon and say, here you go, good luck. That's not how the Father works with us. He's with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's with us through thick. He's with us through thin. He's with us through the highs. He's with us through the lows. Much, if not most, of our discipleships today, um, most of our discipleship efforts, everything, a majority of the things that we do today in discipleship, it, is, uh, it really focuses on content and curriculum. We're looking to put, I shouldn't say we, it's not I, I'm not trying to bash anybody in any way, shape, or form, but we like to put together a formula, or as the awesome song, Lord, break down our traditions and break down our religions, we put God in a box, and we say, if you do A and B, it equals C. And a lot of our discipleship programs have to do with do good, get good, do bad, get bad. That just isn't always the case. I would, you know, if it was that simple, it wouldn't be God. Um, I know, that, that's a hard pill to swallow. He focused on relationship, not curriculum. Number three, he focused on ascending capacity, not a seating capacity. I'm going to pull that out of uh, Mark 3, 14 and 15. He focused on ascending capacity, not a seating capacity, and so should we. <laughs> so should we. Um, Jesus' goal was not to have the 12 go through a program. I'm specifically in my head for some reason thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous, an AA program. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that Jesus never intended to have the 12 go through a program, and then they were going to turn to 24 and then to 48, and that they would all sit stationary at the feet of Jesus and never do anything, and Jesus did it all. I know it sounds good. I know that goes against a lot of our the theology but that is not true. The reason that Jesus is spending time with us and, and we're learning from him, we're gleaning from God the Father is so that ultimately we can go and do it too. So uh, his goal was that he might send forth. Let me see here. Yeah, so all of this stuff where I'm saying, these are in the King James Version. I read to you guys out of the New Living Translation. But uh, in verse 14 in the King James, it says, He ordained the twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Hmm. There's a good chance that that's what the Lord's doing with each and every one of you guys. When you spend time with him, you're going to develop your own way of delivering uh, the, the good news to other people. You go a little bit further, he's going to give you the power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And you thought you were just signing up to go to heaven. Not exactly. You were signing up to snatch people out of the grasp of the evil one. <clears throat> so his goal was that he might send forth, that they would do with others what he had done with them. You know, there, there is, you know, doctorates and masters and all these graduates, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? Once you've been educated so much, how long before you have to, you can't just go to school forever. Eventually, you've got to get out and go to work. Or you can go to school forever. But, <laughs> ah, thank you, Father. Jesus wants us to get to the place where we would do what he was doing. That's the whole purpose of discipleship. Um, I, I wish I would have been here because it comes to my head all of the time when Miss Trinity had a word. And I, and I still haven't, maybe I should just ask corner you at the end of service so you could share it with me about, about, this, about our local body and when are we going to get past the elementary things. You know, this sounds harsh. It's not harsh. It really isn't. It's the Lord pulling us up into something better. You know, how long are we going to preach salvation? How long are we going to preach baptisms? How long are we going to preach the element? When are we going to preach the elementary things of God and move into the deeper things? That didn't come from me. That came from my amazing friend. So take it up with her. <laughs> <laughs> not that they're elementary at all, but the whole purpose of a spending time with, with Jesus is so that we can be the light to the world. You, you understand? 
It says, once they could preach, once they could preach and they had authority to drive out demons and authority to heal the sick, the apprenticeship was complete. He sent them. He sent them. <clears throat> Our approach should be similar to that of Jesus. You know, we have to get to a place where we're comfortable bringing people in, uh, letting them sit here for two, three, four, five years, however long it takes. Some people learn faster than others. And once they get to a certain place, we have to be comfortable with going, Psh, there's my seal of approval. Get on out there and save the world, Captain. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Not all of us are just going to sit here for our whole entire lives. Some of us aren't going to sit here for 75 years of our life in the same exact seat. <laughs> you know what I mean? We love each other. We're going to go about endeavors and then come back and, you know, go over to the world and come back and share with everybody what's been going on in your life and how the Lord's been moving. And that's what brings life and happiness and joy and expectancy. And everybody's like, oh man, it encourages us to all get out and do something. We don't want the people we are mentoring to be our permanent assistants. I mean, I would like that. But <laughs> I would love to have a permanent assistant. Uh, I got one, Susie. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> it says, uh, you know, we want, them to, we want them to grow. We want, we want people that we're discipling, and the Father wants us to grow to our full capacity. Um, at some point, we have to commission them and send them out with a blessing. At some point, we have to. You know what I mean? I bless you. you you've done good. Now get out there and make your own messes. You know, uh, maybe it's bad. I don't know. My son moved out, and I'm grateful. And he's made a few messes, and I've been there for him. You know, I'm not going to overreach. I'm not going to get him out of trouble, but I'll advise him. You know what I'm saying? And I got one who's working on it. <laughs> you know, we shouldn't be 95 years old living in the basement of our mom's house. That just isn't the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, wow. Number four, it's... Uh, 315, it's he handed off authority instead of holding on to it. And so should we. <laughs> um, not only did Jesus send his disciples out, but he also gave them the authority to heal sickness and drive out demons. Don't underestimate the authority that Yeshua, that Jesus has given all of us. We should feel fully empowered. We have been commissioned to minister his word, to minister his love, to minister his grace, to set the captive free. To feed the hungry. We, get the, we got an awesome opportunity again, August 27th, to go to the food pantry and give out 10,000 pounds of food. I don't hear any yippies and yays. <laughs> serving, serving, serving the kingdom, it is work, yo. It's work. It's, it's, it's not being served. It's serving he says, if you want to be great in the kingdom, you've got to be the servant of all. Who wants to be great in the kingdom? Me! Who wants to serve? Not me. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. Please consider coming to help us move food on August 27th. Um, for those of you that have been coming, thank you. Barbara, you're amazing. This is what, the, this is what it's supposed to be. He shows up, comes to church, makes a few relationships, right into servanthood. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Not me. I want to show up for five years and sit on my rump and have everybody tell me how awesome I am. No, that's not how it works. Thank you, Barbara, for serving. Thank you, Billy, for serving. <clears throat> uh, now, let me see here. We should, we should feel fully empowered, commissioned to minister, and blessed to go even further than Christ did. What? You're going to go further than Christ did. Isn't that crazy? Well, you guys already know. There's Scripture for it. I wouldn't be up here saying it if there wasn't Scripture for it. So John 14, 12 is again, it says, awesome Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, the guy that I'm in love with. I know that sounds weird. It feels weird to say it, but I love him. <laughs> it says, he says, the truth is anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater. That's what I want. Believe it or not, that's what I strive for. And if sometimes that looks like arrogance, please forgive me. That is not my heart. It is not my heart. But I do have the attitude, if my brother did it, because Jesus is also our brother, 
He was the firstborn of many. If my brother did it, I can do it. And that's the attitude that I have all the time. And you know what? Sometimes arrogance, sometimes confidence looks like arrogance to those that make excuses. You know that? When I know I can do it because my God and my Savior did it and He said that I can do it, to the person that doesn't believe they can do it, they think that's arrogant and cocky. Like, how dare that guy? Who does he think he is? I'll tell you who I am. I'm the Son of the Most High. And so are you. You just need to renew the way that you think. Change the way that you think. Renew your mind to His plans, His purposes. Oh, you need a disciple. In fact, that person I can't stand, I'm going to try to spend time with you. You know, it's the ones that are really broke, the ones that we didn't want nothing to do with, the ones that we can't stand. Those are the ones that need their hearts changed. Those are the ones that need renewed. Those are the ones we got to gather up under our wings and encourage. Come on, quit drinking a fifth of whiskey a day. Drink a pint. Come on, quit drinking a pint a day. Quit drinking. But it's got to start somewhere. we got to get our, our poop boots on and get on out there and get at it. <clears throat> To change the world, we need not only to change people, but we need to mobilize the people we change so that they will change others. It's simple. It really is. This is, the Father helped me, now I want to help them, and I want them to pass. The best way that I can put this is with our children. If, if any of you guys have children, the best that you have done, you want that to be their starting point. So I can see this in my life. My, my stepdad, my stepdad uh, he did the same thing that, that I'm doing. Um, he, he gave me his knowledge he gave me the best that he had to give me. And I'm grateful for that. Now I took what he gave me, the knowledge, and I made very different strategic financial decisions. And hopefully when I'm done doing what I'm doing, my son and my daughter, you know what I'm saying? They'll have, I, bought, I, bought, I have trucks and I have, a, I have machines and I have a building and my dad didn't have that. I took what he gave me, and I made that my launching point. And now I'm developing a system that I'm going to give to my kids. My kids aren't going to have to buy trucks, and they're not going to have to buy machines. They're not going to have to buy buildings because it's already been bought and paid for. So the best that I can do, I'm going to hand to my kids so that that can be their starting point. And that's what discipleship is about. That's what discipleship is about. It is about taking the best that I have and giving it to a loved one. Now, that's a special something because Christ is asking you to take the best that you have and give it to somebody that you don't love. You talk about stretch. <laughs> Again, to change the world, we need to not only change people, but mobilize people that we change to change others. A lot of times we change people and then we are their ball and chain. We get people to a certain place of breakthrough, but we want to keep our thumb on them, and we want to rule them with an iron fist, and you're going to do what I say, and we get on these inferiority complexes of I'm better, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. That is not, I mean, that is not the kingdom way. That's like 75% kingdom, but 25% not. You know what I'm saying? And I think the Lord is asking for a wholehearted commitment, commit, commitment to His ways, and His ways are... He brought these disciples with him for three years. He did a lot of stuff for them. And but all these crowds follow him. He teaches them the Sermon on the Mount. He gives them the Sermon on the Mount. And then right after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, you know, Mark 3, 13, after Jesus went up onto a mountain and he called the ones he wanted to go with him and they came to him, then he selected the 12 of them to be his regular companions, calling them apostles. And then, immediately, then, he sent them out to preach and gave them authority to cast out demons. And these are the names of the twelve that he chose. As soon as you come into the kingdom, believe it or not, as soon as you give your life to Christ, you are now commissioned to do that stuff. Now, it might be wise to get under somebody that's done it a little bit. You can try. You know what I'm saying? But God takes everything and uses it for the good of those that are called according to His purposes and those that love Him. So if you love Him and He saved your soul and you get out there and you try to cast demons out of people and it maybe doesn't work, I bet you learn from it. If you get out there and, and, you, and you see somebody that's, that's, that's in a rough situation and you feel led to, by the Lord to pray for them and you pray for them and, it doesn't, and nothing happens, I bet you learn from it. You know what you learn? Persistence. You know what you learn? Don't give up. You know what happens when you try to cast a demon out of somebody and it don't work? 
and you get your tail kicked, <laughs> you learn how not to do it. You won't do that again. But that doesn't mean give up. It doesn't mean give up. Um, ah, thank you, Lord. I want to leave you guys with this. I want to leave you with what I opened with. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. This is Jesus. He says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, he gave us, he's, he, the, he died so that we can do this stuff. And you don't do the stuff just in this box. Believe it or not, the greatest ministry happens out there. I, may, I hit home runs all the time, and I strike out all the time. But I tell you what, if I don't swing, it never happens. I found myself praying with a guy in the middle of his living room. Sweaty, nasty. I mean nasty. Look horrible. Working outside and struck up a little conversation with him. He invited me in his house, and I ended up praying with the dude. Another dude invited me into his barn and offered me a beer, and I, he told me he had a pacemaker, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to pray for him, and I chickened out. And I chickened out. I don't know why I chickened out. 90% of the time, I'm in it. I'm in it. But for some reason, this time I chickened out. What the Lord is showing me is that I still got work to do. I have not reached my glorified body. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes all the time. But I think all of us, that what makes somebody special, what, what does this word say? You know, um, a man falls down, a, a righteous man falls down six times but gets up seven. Seven? A righteous man falls down seven times? Well, Listen, you are the righteousness of God. And if you fall, get back up. He loves you. He created you for greatness. Good. Um, so with that, I just, I just, we're just going to close. Um, is there anybody out here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? I want to ask you guys that. Um, anybody out here in, in, the, in the crowd, in person, or if, even anybody online that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Um, I would encourage you to, the Bible says to confess with your mouth and to believe with your heart. And I, I, I've, I can hear you confess with your mouth, but I can't say whether you believe in your heart. That's between you and him. This is all a personal invitation from Christ to you. Um, you know, I could tell you that it's to spend eternity in heaven, and that's just a byproduct of it. Spending eternity with God is just a byproduct. What he's really looking for is an intimate relationship with you. He wants to transform your life. And, and it is amazing. It really is amazing. The people that he brings in and out of your life is it's second to none. I mean, he brings people in your life that just wants what's best for you. They don't want your money. They don't want what you can give them, your, your stuff. They just want to love you unconditionally. And uh, so, <laughs> I didn't get any takers here. Um, in person. So if you would just bow your heads and pray with me and for anybody online that's watching. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. Jesus, we thank you for dying for our sins. We thank you that you were the perfect sacrifice, the atonement of my sins. For your word says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And so, Lord, we just confess our sins to you. We repent, Father. We repent. We turn from, from our wicked ways and we come into alignment into alignment with what it is that you're doing, with your ways, Father. We want to lay down our selfish ambition and we want to humbly walk with you. Lord, we ask that you would transform our hearts, transform our minds. And Lord, we want to dedicate our life service, transfer it from sin and transfer it into your hands, a life of love and gratitude and uh, just working with you. Lord, we ask that you would come into our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.